All right, and let me not forget the chat window in case anyone wants to type into the chat window. <clears throat> so today, we're going to resume our discussion of the Hamiltonian formulation of classical mechanics. <clears throat> we're looking at a variety of in interesting applications. And as you know, yesterday, <clears throat> I posted homework assignment number 10, where we do look at um, a variety of applications of the Hamiltonian formulation. <clears throat> the homework assignment begins with a fascinating piece written by a famous mathematician. Uh, and this was a remarkable thing when uh, Edward Witten, a physicist, received the Fields Medal. That's kind of like the Nobel Prize in mathematics. You know, there's really no Nobel Prize in mathematics, but they do have the Fields Medal. <clears throat> so it's remarkable that a physicist would win the Fields Medal. Um, and <clears throat> the survey of his work, which earned him the Fields Medal, includes several references to the Hamiltonian formulation. Okay, so what we're doing in this homework assignment, let's draw a picture. Okay. As you know, we have recently studied the motion of a rigid body. In particular, a free rigid body is a fascinating problem. And it's useful to review this because, of course, this is one of our foundation uh, results. This is a major achievement of classical mechanics to explain the motion of a free rigid body. <laughs> we like to work in a coordinate system Okay. Uh, these are the components of the angular momentum referred to the body frame. Okay, so uh, the quantity L1, here's a, a unit vector. This is the E1 hat unit vector. We have a dot product, and there's the angular momentum vector. These are familiar uh, <coughs> constructions from our studies of the motion of a free rigid body. Okay, Now for a free rigid body, the angular momentum vector is a constant in the laboratory frame, which we call the space frame. Okay, But the unit vectors, they move in a very complicated and mysterious manner. And again, a big thank you to the people on the space shuttle who filmed uh, the remarkable motion of the T-handle. Right? You remember the so-called dancing T-handle, where we had a very nice illustration of the intermediate axis theorem the fact that the intermediate axis is unstable. Okay, the lack of stability of the intermediate axis appears in this diagram <clears throat> in the following way. Okay, now um, the situation is the document camera was a little sluggish, but I do believe the laptop, which contains the audio feed, uh, survived that little uh, lack of performance from the uh, hotel Wi-Fi here. Okay. And so <clears throat> what we did uh, several lectures ago, and again, this is on the current homework assignment, um, part of the uh, analysis included the observation that we do have a couple of conserved quantities. <clears throat> the entire angular momentum vector, this L vector is conserved in the laboratory frame, but in the body frame, the individual components L1, L2, and L3, these are not constant. However, the sum of the squares is constant. Okay, so we do have this one constant of the motion. Um, okay, so <clears throat> with reference to these uh, axes, the tip of the angular momentum vector must always be are located on a spherical shell. Okay, so and the, the radius of that shell, of course, is the length of the angular momentum vector as measured in the um, in this in the space frame. So I'll draw a spherical shell. Okay, so far so good. I've drawn a spherical shell. Now um, at this point, because we want to have a 
a very accurate <clears throat> perspective view. This is a perspective view, obviously showing the three axes. They're mutually orthogonal axes. Obviously on the paper, they're not orthogonal. This is more like 120 degrees on the paper, but it is intended to conjure up an image in a three-dimensional space of three axes, and they are pairwise orthogonal. <clears throat> okay, the center of the sphere here is at the origin. And now for a quality perspective view, we must observe that the North Pole is here. This is the North Pole, right? This up here is not the North Pole where I'm pointing with the pen. That's the horizon. The horizon from our perspective, we're quite distant from the sphere, but nevertheless, the same definition of the horizon applies, and that's the horizon over there. All right, the L1 axis punctures the sphere here, and the L2 axis punctures the sphere here. Okay, now we've used the term separatrix, and this is a, a, a very general term when you study solutions to differential equations. The separatrix is a boundary between regions that exhibit different behavior. All right, let's see if we can do justice to this separatrix here. Um, Okay, and so now we can summarize, um, I'll, I'll draw some more separatrix here. This separatrix, what I'm gonna do is draw this because this is hidden from view over here. And um, at this location, we have the L2 axis intersecting the spherical shell and waiting for the document camera to kick in. We do have a slow Wi-Fi. Okay, what I can do is step in and, oh, there it goes, now it's working. And at some point I'm gonna step in and switch the iPad Pro over to my local hotspot network on the mobile phone. But uh, we can identify this point here. This is the antipodal point. And so this um, line kind of heads over there behind the horizon like so. Okay. <clears throat> so um, the motion, as you know, if we're near the L1 axis, the streamlines circulate around here like this. And nearby, they kind of resemble ellipses. They're not perfect. They're kind of more like potato chips, if anything, because they're certainly not planar. But the, uh, the streamlines of the vector field go around like so. And when we say vector field, it's precisely this vector field that we're going to analyze uh, on the homework assignment. OK. So now, as you get further away, they start to mimic the structure of the separatrix. And again, the construction is one that you can do. We're talking about intersections. We have a spherical shell and the kinetic energy, right? The total kinetic energy, which is a very similar construction. Uh, okay, now this document camera, okay, I'm gonna, it's, it's messing with me. Every time I decide to go with the hotel Wi-Fi, then, okay, now it's working. All right, you know what? I think we're gonna switch this iPad Pro. My patient has, my patients have run out here. Uh, okay, so I'm going to settings. This, what I'm doing is I'm telling this uh, document camera to change its Wi-Fi. Okay, and here we go. I've instructed it to switch to a different network. And I have a check mark that can only mean that Okay, I'm hoping this is going to deliver Okay, now I need to use I'm going to use gravity to flip it over. Come on. It has to understand we're flipping over. Yeah, there we go. Okay, look at that. Yeah, I think we got a better experience now. <clears throat> the kinetic energy is also a constant. And as you know from the current homework assignment, the structure is similar. We have these squared components. There's an L1 squared, L2 squared, L3 squared, um, <clears throat> but they have different prefactors according to the moments of inertia. And the result is if you plot this equation here, kinetic energy equals constant. If you plot it in this space, you get these ellipsoids, which I like to think of as surfboards, right? Because that's a nice way to think of an ellipsoid. It has a one axis that's much longer than the other two. 
and then there's the intermediate axis, and then there's a shorter axis. All right, so this is a construction we, we did study at, at one point earlier in the course. So I'll draw, there's a family of solutions that go like this. Okay, so all of these curves, they, in terms of like, we, we like to make observations about the topology. All of these curves here, they go around this fixed point. Remember, this is a, a solution to the equations of motion. What we have here is a rigid object that is steadily rotating around the number one axis. Okay, and the same is true here. This dot is a, is a solution it's a solution where the motion in this picture is a constant. You simply stay here. And uh, back in the space room, what happens is the rigid object is spinning around the number three axis. We have steady rotation around the number three axis. If you're near wide, nearby, we have the wobble. Okay. So this would be a generic case where you perhaps you've given it a small bump and now it's wobbling. So the angular momentum here in the body frame, this picture is the body frame. Um, should really say the body angular momentum frame. Let's squeeze that in here, the body angular momentum frame. So we have these three components of the angular momentum. And we know again, there's a family. Let's see if I can uh, <coughs> indicate we have a smooth and uniform transition. So if you're nearby this fixed point, we kind of circulate, circulate around on an elliptical path. Now, as you explore larger ellipses, you. Well, I kind of botched that one, but it's okay. This is supposed to be an impressionistic sketch. You see they go over the horizon like so, and um, like so. And then as you get closer to the separatrix, they start to get deformed like this. Okay. And finally, you have these paths. They go very, and this is what the dancing T-handle was doing. You have a curve that goes like this, right? So for the dancing T-handle, um, I did post the video in the appropriate homework folder. Um, the system, if you look at the evolution of the angular momentum vector in the body frame, it goes here, it's moving very slowly. So let's put that here as a remark. L moves slowly here. Okay, and that is a remark that applies to this location, this region here, okay? And then it moves quickly here. Okay, so this is kind of a, a thought bubble. It's a little remark we put here. L moves slowly here. L moves quickly here. Okay, we're off the edge and now we're back on. So this is a remark. Okay. Again, the angular momentum in the body frame, it moves very slowly here. We can understand that based on Euler's equation. It's extraordinarily slow here. Then as you move away, it moves quickly. So I'm going to have to just draw an arrow right across the picture like this. Okay, so I've indicated with these arrows, we're, <clears throat> we're focusing our attention on this curve, the angular momentum vector, and now we're making statements about the time evolution. It moves slowly here, it moves more quickly here. And that's this remarkable behavior with the dancing T-handle. You can also demonstrate it with a tennis racket, et cetera. Um, this quick half twist, that's this motion here. In the body frame, the angular momentum moves quickly like so, okay? So the important thing is that these curves, these are streamlines of a vector field. Let's put that here. These curves Okay, that's a remark. 
That's a remark that applies to all of these curves. All of these curves are streamlines, okay? And this is the separatrix. So remember the separatrix is a curve that is a boundary between regions that exhibit different behavior. So let's indicate that here, separatrix. Okay, and I guess stylistically, all of these remarks are being depicted inside their own little box for an extra clarity. And what I'm doing now is labeling the separatrix. I've shown the separatrix with a dashed line. Okay, so there are several remarks we wanna make on this. The most important in terms of the mathematical setting of this problem is the existence of a vector field. Okay, so our main message here is the existence of a vector field. Let's compare this. We're gonna to return to this diagram in a moment. Let's compare this with another vector field, the simple pendulum, right? Compare, and this will be a variant. And there's a separatrix. We're gonna see another separatrix. So I'll draw a big, uh, here's a horizontal dividing line. We're gonna draw a picture for the simple pendulum. And now we need an industrial strength pendulum. A pendulum constructed with a string simply will not do here. We need one with a rigid rod. The pivot is fixed in space. The pendulum is allowed to swing over the top because for this investigation to truly appreciate the topology, um, we're going to scoot. I have a light source over here. We're gonna scoot that using the pen and go like that. Okay. So for the simple pendulum, there's a remarkable picture. Let's draw this picture. We've been using the angle phi for the simple pendulum. And let's say here's the origin, okay? Okay, for this diagram, since we wanna emphasize the phase space view, I'm gonna label this P phi, but you know, P phi, is, uh, <clears throat> P phi is simply a multiple of phi dot. So if you like, you can also use the Lagrangian state space where you have a phi axis going to the right and a phi dot going vertically. The structure will be the same. Okay, now for small oscillations near the uh, most interesting equilibrium, we have these elliptical paths. Again, we'll use the word ellipse because the axes have different units. Okay, so these pictures here, this is typical small oscillations of the pendulum. And of course, there's a solution. I should draw a pronounced dot. The dot I drew there is a solution just as this dot, this dot, and this dot, and the dots on the other side. Those are solutions, right? It's a solution where you have uh, an equilibrium, okay? For the case of the simple pendulum, this dot represents a solution where the pendulum just hangs straight down and is motionless. That's a perfectly good solution. Uh, the, the angle phi is zero and it is constantly zero. So phi dot is zero as well. That's a solution, the pendulum just hanging straight down. There are other solutions. Um, let's, I wanna plan out and budget my space here. There's another solution where the pendulum is balanced vertically up, upright. Okay, remember we have a rigid rod for this pendulum and um, we got a name for this solution, it's pi. Let me, uh, I gotta be careful because I'm gonna draw some uh, interesting structure here. So I will be labeling this, this is the phi axis, that's an angle. This particular location is pi and that's the solution, it's a constant. Okay, what we wanna do is appreciate the structure that emerges here, this is minus pi. Uh, again, that's a solution. This is two pi. So <clears throat> in this business we do, and Taylor speaks of the rolling motion of the pendulum. So it's gonna be important to us to mark these other locations. Here's minus two pi. I will label them in a moment. So the important thing is that there's a separatrix here. In the earlier picture, I used a dashed line for the separatrix. Let's draw the separatrix here.
Okay. So now let's talk about the motion of the system. We'll start with equilibrium. This dot, which I'm indicating with the pen, the pendulum is hanging straight down and it's motionless. Wonderful, that's the solution. If you give it a slight bump, then in this diagram, we're gonna be moving around this curve. And let's talk about this for a second. If you give the pendulum a slight bump, now you've got small oscillations. So certainly in terms of the phi variable, we're gonna be moving back and forth, okay? Now as we move from left to right, phi dot is positive. So you see we're moving clockwise in this picture. And I could start to put little arrows on here. I'm going to attempt to put little arrows and I've, I've landed my first arrow there. We move clockwise around this picture. And again, the motivation is if we're here at a negative value of phi and now the pendulum's gonna swing back positive, then phi dot must be positive. So that means as we swing through the origin, phi equals zero, um, phi dot is positive. So uh, we have clockwise motion along these curves. Going, swinging from positive to negative, for example, as you swing through the origin, you're here. So this, where I'm indicating with the pen, that, that location, we have phi equals zero and phi dot is negative. P phi is negative, phi dot is negative. So again, the motion of the system in this diagram, we move around on these paths. They look kind of elliptical. They're not perfect ellipses, but they look somewhat elliptical. All right, now let's start talking about, um, <clears throat> you get to more extreme motion. Okay, so there's a pretty decent, this pendulum is swinging. Remember that's pi, so that's 180 degrees. 90 degrees is about here. So this is a pretty decent headset. Okay, now let's, let's consider even bigger. This is getting to be large amplitude. And you remember at the beginning of the course, we computed the period. So we know how to find, we can set up an integral and find how long it takes to go around. <clears throat> but now let's use intuition. Let's look at a pendulum and I'll draw a few pictures. So this of course is phase space, right? This is phase space. All right. Let's draw a few quick diagrams down here. Uh, we have a pivot. This is fixed in space. And let's draw a picture of the large amplitude motion. I'm going to scoot that light source over again. All right. So for a typical large amplitude motion, I'll draw a vertical reference line like so. And large amplitude motion looks like this. Those are the classical turning points and the system swings through. We have a very dramatic swing. And I think some acrobats actually I should say Olympic gymnasts, they do this on the, what's it called, the high bar, when they start swinging around like this. Anyways, let's, uh, this picture here shows physical space, right? In contrast to this diagram, this diagram is showing us phase space. This is a picture we're showing one solution. Okay, one solution. And parenthetically, let's record, this is a large amplitude solution. In physical space. Okay, so the title of this picture, let's underline it because this is the title. This picture shows you one solution. It's a large amplitude solution in physical space. So you could put an X axis to the right measured in meters. You could put a Y axis going up measured in meters. And these are the classical turning points. Remember we have the notion of classical turning points. That's one classical turning point. And this thing over here, okay. So the pendulum, let's see if I can indicate this with this pen cap. Suppose this pen cap is the pendulum. This is the equilibrium where it hangs straight down. Now what we do is we displace it. We have a very large, we lift the pendulum up to here and then we let it go. 
what happens is it swings down. It starts kind of slowly, but then it swings down. It swings through here going very quickly. And then it swings, it gets way over here. And again, that's the classical turning point. You know, at the, at the classical turning point, the kinetic energy is zero. Okay. The kinetic energy is zero. So we'll put, uh, we have to extend this like so. T equals zero. And also P phi equals zero. Okay. So at the classical turning points, <clears throat> we have zero kinetic energy and also the momentum is zero, all right? So let's look at our picture here. This diagram, this entire diagram here is visible in this picture as a large amplitude Okay, so this, this entire diagram is a diagram that gives us more detailed information about one of the curves, this curve here. All right, so what we're doing here, we're starting to appreciate the existence of different spaces in this problem, okay? This diagram, again, uh, the large, amp this is a very large amplitude, and the important thing to appreciate is in this territory, the pendulum moves slowly. And we could, we could draw a more extreme picture where it goes up extraordinarily close to the vertical. Not quite vertical, but it gets very close. If you release the pendulum very close to the vertical, then it starts moving slowly. It gathers speed. It swings quickly down through here. It moves very quickly. And then it goes back up on the other side and again moves slowly. So we can make remarks slow. Right, you recall we made some remarks here. L moves slowly here, it moves very slowly here, and it moves quickly here. So let's make the same remarks slow. Here it's moving very slowly. Uh, wait, let's see. Am I there's one? Yeah, so <clears throat> let's not confuse the velocity in this picture with the velocity in this picture. Notice at the turning point, P phi is zero. That's right here. So this is the classical turning point. We should label the classical turning point. I guess I'll use the same, the same label and the same dotted line. The classical turning point is right here. This is a dotted line, not to be confused, the separatrix is a dashed line. Okay, so here's, again, this is the picture in physical space. The pendulum swings back and forth. This is very large amplitude motion, and it moves slowly here. In, in the physical space, right, in physical space, it's momentarily at rest. But in this picture, it's still moving, right? We're going around this uh, elliptical, it's a quote, elliptic, it's not really an ellipse, right? It's a blob. You can see as you get closer and closer to the separatrix, it's gonna get a somewhat sharp feature, right? There's a sharp feature for truly large, if you go to 189 degrees, if you release this thing one degree away from vertical, right, it will move very slowly and you would have to draw a curve in here. You can see it's not ellipse because it has a, a feature that's still smooth, but it's starting to look like it might get a kink, right? As you approach this critical point, the curve would get a kink. Um, <clears throat> okay, so those are some remarks. Now let's talk about other parts of this diagram. This is the critical point. We're gonna say some more words about it. The separatrix goes through here. Oh, this is dash for separatrix. Remember dash for separatrix. Um, there's another equilibrium over here. All right, some of this is behind our inset picture. And there's another one of these over here. Again, in, in the interest of saving time, I must compromise and make the diagram a little bit sloppy. Okay, the diagram has to be sloppy because we cannot sit around all day drawing nice pictures. Uh, okay, so again, you have these ellipses like so. See, I'm saving lots of time by being very quick and efficient here. And this is periodic. You see this thing just repeats over and over again. <clears throat> okay, 
Then we have the rolling motion. Let's talk about the, there are solutions here. If you have enough kinetic energy, you go over the top. And these curves here, I'm gonna start drawing curves that go like so. So to have a good appreciation of what's going on here, I am making an effort to do a pretty good job on these curves. Okay, so that's the so-called rolling motion. As you get further away, they get less extreme. They start to get smoothed out. This is the rolling motion. You have enough kinetic energy to go over the top. And you can say, as if you really increase the kinetic energy, it's just gonna be spinning around. That would be way up here. We don't have enough space on the paper, but way up here, if you have large kinetic energy, the thing just spins around. It does slow down a bit, then it speeds up a bit but we have these kind of solutions. This is the pendulum really spinning around. Um, we have the same structure down here. So it's gonna get a little crowded in our diagram, but we have to draw these. This is the rolling motion going the other way, right? You can spin the pendulum clockwise. You can spin it counterclockwise with lots of kinetic energy. This curve has just enough energy to get over the top with a little to spare. Okay, I don't wanna get it too messy in that region. It's getting too crowded. Um, but again, rolling motion going the other way. <clears throat> okay, the separatrix, again, everything we've said about the separatrix, it is a boundary in phase space. And quite generally, when you solve differential equations, there will be regions that exhibit different behavior. So we have a region here around the origin. We know they go clockwise around that equilibrium. That point right there is an equilibrium. These curves go clockwise around the equilibrium. Then there's a separatrix. The solutions out here are fundamentally different. They're not periodic. They go on forever in this diagram. And in terms of our phase space diagram, they go on forever. Now, remember, this is the phi axis. And some purists would say, well, I really don't like how your phi axis goes out to plus or minus infinity. You could draw an equivalent picture with a loop, right? The phi axis really, you could have. Uh, you could bend that axis into a circle, like you would bend it behind the paper, make it into a circle, and that would be an alternative way to describe this. But it's often done this way with a phi axis that goes out to plus or minus infinity. So you have the ability to count how many times, the so-called winding number. The winding numbers are important in mathematical physics. It counts how many times you go around. <clears throat> okay, so again, these are for the rolling motion. Okay, this would be a typical example for the rolling motion, and we do have the rolling motion up there. <clears throat> so to make a connection between these two pictures, right, this is for the simple pendulum. Again, that's our old friend, a, a pendulum, it swings in a plane. It's a one degree of freedom problem, right, one degree of freedom. There's our generalized coordinate. We're using phi, and this was, this was a really messy one here, but you you see, that one's kind of impressionistic. <clears throat> okay, so what is important to us here is the critical point. This is a critical point. It's an unstable equilibrium. And now it's time for the red pen. You know, it's pretty important when we've got the red pen. We're gonna label the critical point. This one has a bunch of critical points. Okay, we have a bunch of critical points. Um, so I will label them unstable equilibrium. Critical point, recall, we have an unstable equilibrium. Yeah, I'm really happy with the document camera now with the, I just waved goodbye to that hotel Wi-Fi and use the uh, mobile phone hotspot. Okay, so the critical points. <clears throat> this is a critical point, and we're gonna relate this to the tennis racket and the dancing tea handle, right? Because again, the critical points are important. There's a critical point here. This is pretty crowded over here, but we're gonna draw critical points. And there's another critical point over here, etc. So we have a sequence of critical points. <clears throat> so remember, and now I can label the axis. I can squeeze in the pi here. 
I put the pi, I put the minus pi right here. Okay, that's a little hard to read, but that's a minus pi. Okay, this is two pi. That means um, if you move the pendulum around once and then reduce the kinetic energy, it's going to oscillate. Okay, but if you have a bookkeeping principle, you keep track of the winding number, then this is very important. We got a two pi here. And this is minus two pi. Okay, and then the next critical. So this one, this is a critical point at three pi. This is a critical point at pi. This is a critical point at minus pi. <clears throat> so you can see odd numbers times pi. That's where we have the critical points. Unstable, odd times pi. The stable are even. So unstable is an odd number times pi. Odd integer. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at our other picture. This is the one you're studying on the homework. Um, again, it's the existence of the vector field that is really important to us. The Hamiltonian formulation gives us uh, differential equations. They're first order differential equations. Uh, Q dot equals something, P dot equals something. And so there's a vector field tangent to this sphere. And the vector field tells you how quickly or slowly to go. So uh, now I would like to start bringing in the, the color. Once again, here's the red pen. These are the important things to us. It moves slowly, and I want to really emphasize, to make that statement, you have to do more than invoke the constancy, right? We learned a lot when we wrote down the fact that the length of the angular momentum is a constant, angular momentum vector, and we learned a lot when, when we wrote down that the kinetic energy is a constant. But we could not make a statement about how quickly or slowly the system moves in this picture. Using Euler's equations, you can do that, okay? And of course, the Hamiltonian formulation gives you an equivalent vector field. The vector field moves slowly here and it moves quickly here. Okay, so the point of this discussion is, um, you know, we're filling in some details for the current homework assignment. We have some interesting stuff going on there with, this is a phase space. So the structure here, you'll hear mathematicians say, this is a phase space. This is, it is a two-dimensional phase space. Phase spaces are always even dimensional. And this is a two-dimensional phase space, but it's not a plane, it's a sphere. It's a two-dimensional spherical shell. This is a 2D phase space. And that statement deserves extra emphasis using both our stylistic element of putting a box and adding some dramatic red color because that's the takeaway message here and that's what you're exploring on the current homework assignment. This thing which is often called the angular momentum sphere, people like to talk about this as a nice example, the, the observation, the realization that this two-dimensional manifold possesses the structure of a phase space, right? There's a vector field defined that's tangent to this sphere, and that's what you're studying in the homework. And it precisely has the structure of a Hamiltonian phase space. There are some keywords when you take physics 205. Let's talk about what happens when you take physics 205. You'll talk about the symplectic structure. Okay, so that's up ahead when you take physics 205. How do you take a vector field? Okay, what's the relationship between the Hamiltonian and that vector field? And it turns out you need something else. You need a so-called symplectic form. So for what we're doing in the homework assignment, we just observed there, there is language in the document that states um, <clears throat> we have first order differentiation of the Hamiltonian. That's an important observation. We have first order uh, differentiation of the Hamiltonian. Now in the homework assignment, we compute a certain cross product, the angular momentum vector cross into something. We don't really explain why, but that cross product has to do with this symplectic structure. So on the homework, all right, HW for homework, there's a cross product. Okay. 
okay? That cross product uh, is kind of a manifestation of this symplectic structure. But again, let's save that for when you take physics 205. We want to appreciate what's going on there. But that's more appropriate for physics 205. Okay, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, uh, okay. We got an internet problem. We do have an internet problem. Okay, now I'm worried. Uh, how can I assess the health of my internet? Okay, I think we're back. Uh, I believe if the pen moves on the laptop screen, that means we got good internet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, these are a bunch of observations. Again, it's nice to make the comparison between the simple pendulum and <clears throat> this angular momentum sphere. Okay, let's return to what we were discussing last time, canonical transformations. Okay. This is what we were doing at the end of our last meeting. We talked about the canonical transformations. Let's scoot that thing down some more. Got to move that lamp out of the way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we observed that in the Hamiltonian formulation, <clears throat> you can do more than what we did in the, in the Lagrangian formulation. We, we saw that in the Lagrangian formulation, it's a very powerful tool that you can introduce whatever coordinates you like. If you think there's a good way to describe a configuration, maybe you choose some angles that you really like or some reference point, you can choose whatever generalized coordinates you really like. And you can go through a very clear prescription on how to get equations of motion. You'll get differential equations for those generalized coordinates that you defined, and someone else can define other so the capital Q here is a different choice. The new coordinates here are capital Q. So in this notation, <clears throat> um, you have capital Q as a function of the old Q. Lowercase n is the number of lowercase Q variables. It's also the number of capital Q. So lowercase n is the number of degrees of freedom. And we have a collection of lowercase Q coordinates. We have a different choice. The lowercase could be, for example, spherical coordinates, and the capital Q could be cylindrical coordinates. That's an example of how you have one choice of generalized coordinates, and you can switch to a different choice. But you can go beyond standard uh, well-known things like spherical or cylindrical. You can choose any coordinates you like, confocal, hyperbolic, or make up your own, right? Anything. As long as you can reliably uh, describe a configuration using your coordinates. If you have some recipe to do that, some clear conventions, then that's a valid choice of generalized coordinates. In the Hamiltonian formulation here, indicated with the script H, um, we have a larger class of functions, right? So the new Qs can be functions of the old Qs and little p, little Q and little p. That's what is that's that's the nature of this kind of a statement. This is the notation we use to indicate functional dependence. And again you'll define some capital P's. So that now we have a collection of Q's and P's, the capital ones, these are the new coordinates, and they're functions of the old ones. The one thing that we insist here is that the structure of Hamilton's equations is unchanged. So you can't write down just any functions. We're going to insist that the structure of Hamilton's equations unchanged. So this was a useful example, <clears throat> um, and we're gonna see why uh, it's necessary to have this square root of two P. Right, so the transformation is similar to uh, what we often call polar coordinates, but um, it turns out it's necessary to have this square root of 2p, and some of the mathematics is starting to appear here. We computed the total time derivative like so. Then we took these results and we wrote the same thing. Okay, let's do this. Okay, this is going to be a little challenging here. I think what we're going to do... Okay. So, it's useful to observe that <clears throat> these results for 
q little q dot and little p dot okay we use the chain rule we are very careful we use the chain rule obviously it's a, a multivariable problem we use the chain rule very carefully and we got these equations on the upper piece of paper it's it's useful to observe that you can write those equations using matrix multiplication right it's clear from the structure of these two equations up here that q dot is a linear combination of capital P dot and capital Q dot, and lowercase p dot is a linear combination of capital P dot and capital Q dot. So you can immediately write down a two by two matrix. The lowercase Q dot P dot vector is some two by two matrix times the capital Q dot P dot. What's remarkable is that you can factor it like this. So that two by two matrix can be factored. And to verify that, you would just multiply, observe, that if you have a two by two matrix like this, and if you multiply on the right by a diagonal matrix, what happens is using the standard rules, you know, the standard rules for matrix multiplication, we often put our hand like this to indicate we're picking a column vector out of the second factor, and then we pick a row vector out of the first factor. So a typical construction here would be this column vector, right? Here's a column vector dotted into this row vector. If you form that dot product because of the zero, you get a root 2p times cos q. And that is indeed the coefficient. If you look at q dot up here, there's a coefficient. And I'll, I'll, I'll use the same, you see I'm using the pen, but you can use a ballpoint pen in light shading mode, which is what I'm doing here. And that particular expression there comes from the dot product of this row and this column. It's the coefficient when you uh, express this as a linear combination using matrix multiplication, right? That's that one. So <clears throat> yeah, the matrix factors very nicely for us here in this way. So now we continue with the calculation. Remember, this is the original Hamiltonian. And I'll use the capital cursive H to indicate Hamiltonian. So that's our original Hamiltonian. Um, we have to be clear, this is a different function. So it has to have a different name. Sometimes people get sloppy and they, they just say, well, it's understood that if I have these capital P variables, I'm talking about the new Hamiltonian, but that's really not correct. For example, what if you plug in zero, zero, and you don't know which function to use, right? So, uh, the best practice is to give this function a different name. So here I called it H sub new. This is the new Hamiltonian. It's gotten from the old Hamiltonian uh, by plugging in uh, our expressions. They're visible up here. I'll scoot this paper down just a little bit. Yep, there we go. So this uh, defined the original transformation and we plugged that in here. So now we've got our Hamiltonian. <clears throat> Let us now compute these partial derivatives. We'd like to see the structure emerge in new variables. So we're talking about capital Q and capital P in our new Hamiltonian. Okay, so here we go. This is going to be a fun calculation. We got this partial derivative of the uh, new Hamiltonian with respect to capital Q. Um, all of the remarks we make here are similar in spirit to what we had to grapple with when we first started doing the calculus of variations. We need a name for the partial derivative of this original h with respect to its first argument. And that name is partial h partial q. So that's the name of that partial derivative. We're differentiating this Hamiltonian with respect to its first argument. Then the chain rule tells us we must multiply by the derivative of this thing which was inserted. And we must differentiate with respect to the capital Q. Okay, that gives us the root 2p, that's a constant for this part times the cosine, right? The sine goes to a cosine because of the differentiation. Now there's another occurrence of capital Q here. And so the chain rule tells us we must differentiate H with respect to its second argument. The name of that second argument is lowercase p. So that's this partial derivative. We suppress the arguments. You could in principle write out all this stuff, but that would be tedious. It's understood that this partial derivative is evaluated at this location. And then the chain rule says you must multiply by the derivative of the expression that was inserted there. So we got the root, and this is a capital P, let's make it better, a better capital P, okay? And differentiating this cosine, we get the minus sign. 
Okay, minus sin sine. So that's a minus sine sign times S a sign sin. Okay, we've got another derivative we have to figure out. What's the derivative? And now I must scoot this up a little like so. Partial h. Let's differentiate with respect to capital P. Well, here's the formula. We must look for occurrences of capital P. There's a capital P here, and there's a capital P here. Okay, let's differentiate with respect to capital P. So again, the chain rule tells us we must differentiate the Hamiltonian with respect to its first argument. That's a partial H, partial Q. That's the name of that partial derivative. Now, what's the derivative of this expression with respect to P? Okay, well, the root two is simply a constant. Let's write the root two. We have P to the one half, so that's a one half P to the minus one half. Okay, and now the sine Q is simply a constant for this derivative because that's a partial derivative with respect to capital P. So we copy that sine Q. Okay, and the second term, because we do have an occurrence of capital P here, this is a partial of the Hamiltonian with respect to lowercase p. That's the name of the second input. And uh, very similar structure. We have the root two, I'll just write it as root two over two, p to the minus a half. And the cosine q, it's just a constant for this part of the calculation. Okay. Now, uh, again, you see we have these derivatives, okay? And there are similar remarks to be made. Let's introduce a matrix multiplication. And here's the cool thing. We can write these two equations uh, as a single equation if we do this. We're going to say uh, the column vector partial h nu partial q. Okay, that's the upper component. Again, we're just going to take these two equations and uh, sandwich them into a, a single. I should say we just construct a single column vector that holds both of them. It's really a container for these two equations, partial p. Okay, and again, you, you have linear combinations. We have these derivatives of the original Hamiltonian. Okay, um, notice we can now use Hamilton's equations, right? Hamilton's equations tell us how partial h partial p and partial h partial q those are related to the lowercase q dot, and you can see them up here, the little q dot, little p dot. Okay, so let's put that in place here. We have, and we're gonna be rewarded with a wonderful matrix product, uh, a product of four matrices. It's not often that we get a product of four matrices. Okay, so here we go. We've got the root two p. Again, we can factor it, a one over root two p and that's the capital P. There's a sine Q, cosine Q, minus cosine Q, and sine Q. Okay, and again, we got the partial H, partial Q, partial H, partial P. Of course, partial H, partial P is just Q dot, and partial H, partial Q is minus P dot. So those signs have to be incorporated here. If you do that, um, you have this structure with the matrix. So we have a linear combination of Q dot and P dot. Okay, and now it's time for the grand finale. The grand finale is we take our observation here. Remember Q dot, P dot, that vector is equal to a product of two matrices times a capital Q dot, capital P dot, okay? Now I understand it doesn't quite fit on the document camera, but it might if we do this and pull this piece of paper out here like this. Yeah, we're, we're at the limit of what we can do with our document camera here. We're gonna plug in. It's time for the, the grand substitution, the most grand, I should say the grandest substitution of all. Uh, now we do have this product of four matrices. This diagonal matrix here times this rotation matrix times that rotation matrix times that diagonal matrix 
okay? When the smoke clears, okay, of course we use the associativity of matrix multiplication, okay? We multiply these things out, it turns out that these two rotation matrices give you a 90 degree rotation and the upshot is, all right, that capital Q dot is equal to the partial derivative of the new Hamiltonian with respect to capital P and capital P dot, this is what we wanted to have happen. And we worked hard for this minus sign here, minus partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to capital Q. Okay, and so that's the important thing. When we say, oh, sorry, I went off the camera. The structure, the structure of Hamilton's equations is preserved. So now if you're working exclusively in the new coordinates, once again, you have Hamilton's equations, you know the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to P is Q dot. You can think of that, just think of good old uh, kinetic plus potential. If you have a Hamiltonian that's a P squared over 2M, you can see that it's just helpful to remember the plus sign here. Think of a P squared over 2M, you differentiate that, you get P over M, that's the velocity. So that's a way to remember the plus sign. The minus sign here is because if you have a Hamiltonian that's kinetic plus potential, again, this is just a means of remembering the minus sign. If you have a Hamiltonian that's kinetic plus potential, then this derivative um, in the simplest case would be your familiar minus the gradient of the potential. So the force, remember the time derivative of the momentum is a force, force is minus the gradient of the potential. So the structure of Hamilton's The structure of Hamilton's equations is preserved. Okay, so yeah, canonical transformations. And again, when you take physics 205, you'll be talking about <clears throat> canonical transformations quite a bit. All right, this had, you know, the, the history of the subject is striving to find a transformation. Uh, just as in the case of Lagrangian mechanics, sometimes a good choice of uh, generalized coordinates would really help to clean up the problem and a not so good choice would make for very messy differential equations. So here, the goal with these canonical transformations is can you find a transformation that will essentially give you such differential, such simple differential equations that you can solve them easily? Okay. Um, so let's look at an example for this transformation. Why would you go through this uh, transformation and remember the remark, the remark we had here, this transformation is similar to good old plain polar coordinates, but we have this square root. The square root, it turns out you have to have that square root to make the canonical transformation uh, successful. And we'll talk about uh, other attributes, things like area preserving. We're going to talk about area in phase space. Remember, you can define area in the phase space sensibly you cannot define distances in the phase space, but you can define areas. And we'll talk about what it means to be area preserving. So that was just a quick remark as to why did we put this square root here? It turns out this square root was necessary. Another way to see it is with the area preserving argument. Okay, but um, <clears throat> this calculation that we just went through shows that the structure of Hamilton's equations is preserved. That structure, all right, so that's the subject here. Um, <clears throat> so let's do an example. Suppose the old example, uh, sorry, the old Hamiltonian example. Let's suppose you have a simple harmonic oscillator. Okay, the pendulum's more complicated because the trigonometric functions are in there, but the good old simple harmonic oscillator at its heart At its heart, the simple harmonic oscillator uh, is a one half Q squared plus P squared. Okay, so of course the kinetic energy is really P squared over 2M. So what we've done here is we've set the mass, theorists often do this, we set the mass equal to one and you see that potential energy, we've set K equal to one. The idea is you can always reconstruct the units later so sometimes theorists do this. 
Okay, so if this is your uh, Hamiltonian in the old coordinates, those lowercase coordinates, then the new Hamiltonian, you do the transformation, H nu, which is a function of capital Q and capital P in principle, it is simply equal to capital P. And notice Q is ignorable. So that's the goal. People put a lot of effort into studying canonical transformations. And in Physics 205, you'll talk about uh, a large class. There are actually four large classes and there are so-called so generators, okay? Uh, different means, um, people wanna manufacture canonical transformations that will help you solve problems. So um, this is considered a major milestone. We've done a canonical transformation. The original Hamiltonian uh, was this quadratic, you know, Q squared plus P squared. Going to the new coordinates, the Hamiltonian is just capital P. Q is ignorable. What does that mean? It means that there's no occurrence of Q over here, so partial. Okay. To say a coordinate is ignorable means it doesn't occur in the formula. That's equivalent to saying the partial derivative is zero. Okay, so if the partial derivative is zero, let's, let's look at the implications. We've got a zero here in this Hamilton equation, and so therefore P equals constant. Capital P is a constant. Okay. So if capital P is a constant, what you do is you look at the other one. This partial derivative is a, is a, uh, is a constant, right? It's just one. So Q dot is equal to one. So you see how we've essentially solved the problem. Uh, Q dot is equal to one. So Q evolves linearly in time, the capital Q. And capital P is a constant, um, right? And so you can see from our original discussion, in this case, uh, capital P is just the total energy. And so we have the constancy of the total energy. All right, but that's a nice opportunity to go through the motions for um, <coughs> uh, canonical transformations. Okay, let's look at some of the other fascinating things going on in the world of Hamiltonian mechanics. All right. We're going to uh, have a very general discussion here, and this will exercise our knowledge of chapter eight. Right? We do want to bring in uh, topics from earlier in the course. And one of the important things in chapter eight was this, this idea of the shape of the orbit. For example, for the Kepler problem, the, the orbit could be an ellipse or a parabola or a hyperbola. Okay, we're going to bring in the same uh, notions here all right. And there are some remarkable things that happened recently in our discussions of optics. Okay. So um, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a result that sounds kind of crazy, but here's the result. The Hamiltonian Okay. This may sound crazy, but we'll see in fact it is not crazy. The Hamiltonian for Z evolution is minus PZ. And we'll use lowercase h to distinguish it from the original Hamiltonian. Let's, let's explain what we're doing here. Okay. So this crazy statement, we're gonna see this can be made rigorous and we must explain what's going on here. The Hamiltonian for Z evolution is minus PZ. But remember, we recently had an optics discussion where uh, we did have a Hamiltonian and we saw that the Hamiltonian was minus, in optics you use K, right, for the K vector, the wave number. We had a Hamiltonian that was minus KZ, okay? Now, admittedly, we had to go through that optics discussion very quickly because it's optional material. We don't have a lot of luxury right now for optional material because the final exam is looming uh, a week from tomorrow, right? Um, so we have to kind of focus on central concepts from the course. And as we go through this discussion, we'll be reviewing some of the um, foundation concepts for the course. 
So let's talk about what we're doing here. We're going to start with a Hamiltonian. So our story begins, we're thinking about the motion of a particle in a three-dimensional space. We have a Hamiltonian. So the original Hamiltonian is this usual capital cursive H. There will come a point where we introduce a lowercase h. Okay, so here's our Hamiltonian. We have an R vector, we have a P vector. Okay. We're talking about the motion of a particle. So we have one particle and we're in a three-dimensional space. Right? This R vector, X, Y, Z. This P vector, P, X, P, Y, P, Z. That's uh, the usual kind of notation. So there's our Hamiltonian. <clears throat> All right. Now, for a given value, here's what we're going to do. For a given value, okay, we're going to use capital E for the energy, obviously measured in joules. So for some value of the energy, um, you have a five-dimensional subspace. It's a five-dimensional manifold in the six-dimensional space. And that's what we're thinking about. And you can solve okay and you can get the z component okay so the z component as a function of x comma y comma z comma px comma py Okay, it's useful as we go through this. That sounds rather abstract. Let's, um, as we go through this, we'll have an example. It's useful to have an example so we can see what we're saying here. So an example, suppose the Hamiltonian is familiar, kinetic plus potential. So here you have um, the kinetic energy, the one over two M, and that's the square of the momentum vector. And then we have some sort of arbitrary potential. It could be a, a central force problem. It could be the Kepler problem, et cetera, and so forth. But at this point, we allow for an arbitrary potential u of x comma y comma z, like so. So this is an example. This is called kinetic plus potential, right? Certainly example, a good example, one particle in a three-dimensional space. But for this, uh, for the the more general discussion here on the larger part of the paper, we allow for any sort of Hamiltonian. It could be crazier than this, but this is already very useful. This is the case of a particle of mass m moving in a three-dimensional space under the influence of a conservative force. Okay, so in this case, um, you have Pz equaling, you can just solve and uh, so you set this Hamiltonian equal to capital E, which is a constant, it's a, the total mechanical energy, 2M, we have E minus U of X comma Y comma Z, right? So imagine solving this, we put the capital E here, we're gonna subtract the U, we multiply by 2M, we take a square root, and then we must do a minus PX squared minus PY squared. Okay, so that's a nice concrete example of what it means to solve. You see we have PZ as a function of XYZ, there's the XYZ dependence, and PX and PY, and we're thinking of E as kind of a prescribed constant, so we, we kind of think of that as a constant on a separate footing, it's simply a constant. Okay, so um, the crucial thing now is we're going to make some remarks similar to what we did in optics, we have this three-dimensional space. Okay. And here are the usual axes for the three-dimensional space. Now the motion of the particle could be kind of complicated. It could do something like this, right? We're going to analyze one portion. Remember, if Z is our parameter of evolution, we can take a large portion. It doesn't have to be infinitesimally small. We'll take a portion, and I'm indicating it with a red pen here. Uh, throughout this 
throughout this red part, you can have a single valued x as a function of z and y as a function of z. Okay, so that's what we mean about when we say z evolution. We're going to use z as the parameter of evolution. So as we move along this red portion of the curve, we're going to be thinking of everything as a function of z. Okay, so z evolution means we have x. We're going to solve for x as a function of z, y as a function of z. We're going to get the shape of the orbit. And remember, we use orbit very generally in classical mechanics. So shape of the orbit. <clears throat> okay. That is to say, this analysis is not going to tell us how quickly or slowly we move along this path. And that's very important that we understand how there are some central results in chapter eight. Right? In chapter eight, if you look at the chapter summary, for example, one of our favorite formulas was uh, <clears throat> this formula for r as a function of phi. So I'll put that here. Compare, this is a parenthet parenthetical remark, compare chapter eight. We had r as a function of phi. So that's a parenthetical remark. And again, that gave us the shape of the orbit. We didn't know how quickly or slowly the particle was moving around the elliptical orbit, for example, or maybe it's a hyperbolic uh, kind of a deflection. Uh, but it's very important that we solve for the shape exactly. And that's what we're doing here. We're going to find the shape of this trajectory, at least for one portion. What I've done here is this loop is supposed to kind of indicate the path of the system. The, the trajectory goes back down. And so if you tried to go over here, we would have double valuedness. For one value of z, we would have uh, two different points. So we can't have that. So we restrict our attention to this red portion. We have single valued uh, x of z and y of z. OK, so um, the, the concepts that we're using here are similar to what we did in optics. We introduced this r perp. Our perp is simply x comma y. That's the space perpendicular to the z-axis. Okay, and um, <clears throat> looking at you know looking at our time budget, we you know this is an optional topic. It's not in Taylor's book, but it's very interesting to notice that minus one times this p z, and that's what we have written here. This uh, um, we have Hamilton's equation, so. Our Hamiltonian here is h of r perp p perp p perp is just p x comma p y, and now here's z. So remember, z is the parameter of evolution. So this is like a time dependent. In this case, since z is our parameter of evolution, this is like having a time dependent Hamiltonian. You can have a time dependent Hamiltonian. Um, and it's just equal to minus pz, okay? Where pz is this, this function here, okay? Let's prove that this gives you the correct dynamics. So at this point, we simply plunk down a Hamiltonian, right? We write down this Hamiltonian. To prove that this works, we must compute some partial derivatives, okay? To do that, let's start by looking at dy dz, okay? Remember, dy dz is essentially a velocity because z is kind of playing the role of the time variable, the parameter of evolution. So this is kind of like a velocity, okay? We'll use the chain rule to say that this is dy dt over dz dt, okay? Then we use the original Hamiltonian, right? The original Hamiltonian tells us that dy dt, also known as y dot, this is y dot. Let's just write it out over z dot. We'll use the original Hamiltonian. This is partial. There's the original Hamiltonian, partial py. And here's the original Hamiltonian differentiated with respect to pz. Okay. So um, <clears throat> now we're going to use this celebrated result. Remember, way back at the beginning of the course, we had three, we had a statement about a relationship between three variables. 
if you have three variables that have some sort of functional relationship, then there was an identity, which is actually uh, used in thermodynamics quite a bit. I'll just stick it on the document camera because we don't have time to go through it again in detail. But this was something we proved at the beginning of the course. And this minus one, we worked hard to get that minus one. This is something that is used uh, in thermodynamics, right, quite a bit. You might have the Gibbs free energy, the pressure, et cetera, and so forth. And the thermodynamics, they emphasize using the subscript that one or the other variable may be a constant. Okay, so this uh, wonderful relationship between partial derivatives is what we want to use now. Okay, we have this quotient of these two partial derivatives. And so I'll have to skip some of the details here, but we get a minus partial PZ, partial PY. Okay. And again, this is our triple product rule. Um, this partial derivative was computed holding several variables constant. We're holding x, y, z, px, and pz. Right, we have that partial derivative with respect to y. So we're holding x, y, z, px, pz constant. And for this one, we're holding x, y, z, p, x, p, y constant, all right? For this partial derivative here, we're gonna hold x, y, z, p, x, and the Hamiltonian constant, all right? That's the crucial thing, that assumption, remember we had a capital E for the energy. And so this is exactly what we want, this is our, partial derivative of lowercase h with respect to py. Okay, so again, this is what we wanted, the structure of Hamilton's equations. This is the z derivative, right? This is the quote, time to, z is the parameter of evolution, so it's natural to call this the quote unquote time derivative of y, and it's the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to py, that's what we wanted. And you can show all the other Hamilton, Hamilton equations, all the, others, all the other equations in Hamilton's equations go through as well. So again, this is optional material, but we wanted to uh, take a moment to talk about this remarkable result. There was an interesting analogy with our optics discussions where we saw a Hamiltonian that was minus the Z component. And this is, this is a nice little gem that you can share with friends and relatives. Not very many people know that the Hamiltonian, which is minus one times the Z component of the momentum gives you, you see we have a simplified problem. This is a Hamiltonian, two degrees of freedom. It's time dependent, right? But let's just take a moment to sing the praises here. This is two degrees of freedom, and I'll have to put this in quotes, time dependent, But that's the observation here. Remember the original problem, we had three degrees of freedom. So this is a great achievement. You can take this problem. It's three degrees of freedom, quite generally, even more general than kinetic plus potential, where you can do this for a very general Hamiltonian for three degrees of freedom. Um, and we've distilled the problem down to a two degree of freedom and it's quote time dependent. Z now plays the role of the time and our transverse space is X comma Y. And we can figure out the shape of the orbit. So in summary, if your goal is to find the shape of the orbit, this is a general prescription to get a two degree of freedom Hamiltonian that's time dependent. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the recording and I will stay here for questions. Uh, well, let's see, I have to click on stop. Yeah, stop recording.